Good afternoon and welcome to A Little Lunch. I'm Hillary Simmons, the Executive Director of A Little Help, and I'm so happy to welcome you to our community event today. We're really grateful that you've chosen to spend your lunch hour with us and are here to learn with us about um, Colorado's unique demographic and economic history and future, and to talk more about the importance of employee engagement and what that looks like um, in Colorado and, and hopefully with a little help. Uh, we're focusing on that employee engagement, especially during COVID-19. I know it's been hard to find opportunities to bring your team together and bond um, with such restrictions, but we'll, we'll get more into that. So go ahead and grab your lunch and settle in to enjoy the presentation. We'll be doing a short Q&A um, after each presentation, so feel free to put your questions into the Q&A function on Zoom here, and we'll, we'll be able to get to just a few questions after each presentation. Uh, and if you do have a question that we don't get to, we may have some time towards the end of the presentation, and otherwise we have the ability to follow up with our panelists. So we can get back to you with that. We're also recording this um, webinar and we'll be able to send it to you afterwards and post it um, if you had things you wanted to get back to or to share this with anyone. Uh, before we begin, I'd be remiss not to mention that Colorado Gives Day is coming up on Tuesday, December 8th. Uh, it's an important day of giving online for all Colorado nonprofits and a little help is no exception there. Uh, we need your support to continue helping our older adults to age well in their homes, especially during the pandemic and um, as we go into uh, stricter restrictions again. So um, please mark your calendar for December 8th. And without further ado, I want to introduce our first um, speaker who is Dr. Tom Noel, who's also known as Dr. Colorado. He's a professor of history at CU Denver um, and has been for the last 30 years. He's also written and co-authored over 50 books and other publications about the history of Denver and Colorado. He regularly appears on Nine News and Company TV. Uh, he'll be taking us on a short tour of the history of migration into and out of Colorado, and we're really excited to hear more from Dr. Colorado. So take it away, Tom. Thank you, Hillary, and it's an honor to be with you here at lunchtime. And I think we'll start off with some video that Jason will have on for us, talking about some of the historic migrations into and out of Colorado. And of course, we're most famous for Mesa Verde. And archaeologists estimate at that time, southwestern Colorado had a larger population than it does today. Onward, Jason. Uh, this is the bottom in the basement of Wells Fargo Bank. Bankers don't usually like to predict unpredictable things or horrible messes like this. What, what would happen to Colorado today if we had another great drought like that which changed the chase the ancestral Puebloans out of Mesa Verde. Historic tribes, and this is the Ute Indians on the move, uh, moved in and out of the state, fluctuating populations. It's estimated some 40 different historic tribes, one time or another, were occupying parts of Colorado. Uh, this was what happened, of course, ultimately to the Native Americans. They were wiped out. Here you see the painting, the only known representation of Sand Creek, where some 200 Arapaho Cheyenne meant mostly old men, women, and children were slaughtered. Today, there are only two reservations left in the extreme southwestern Colorado, the Ute Mountain Ute and the Southern Utes. Everyone else has been chased out. And then the gold rush, 1858 gold is found in Cherry Creek in the South Platte River, and that leads to a huge migration. Some an estimated 100,000 people rushed into Colorado, even more than it rushed into California 10 years earlier. People came out here thinking you don't really have to work for a living, you can strike it rich and retire early. And of course, that little gold rush settlement of Denver has spread into the, what we know as the metropolitan area today. And with this map, unfortunately, we don't have Broomfield Drive not in yet. Uh, the largest ethnic group in the state for decades has been Hispanics. And unfortunately, they've suffered under stereotypes of the lazy Mexican. Here you see them sleeping siesta on some barrel. And what an irony 
because whenever you hear uh, see hard work being done, what do you hear? What language do you hear? It's the Spanish who do much of the work. And we're finally celebrating that culture today with things like the Cinco de Mayo celebration you see in the Civic Center here. And I hope that little slideshow helps and we can talk a little bit about these different immigrant groups, starting with the Native Americans, the Spanish, and then the mining rushes. And of course, Colorado's history is pretty much a boom and bust history with uh, mining strikes bringing in huge numbers of people in those towns slowly playing out and people leaving. So you have a constant moving in and out that even the state demographer will have a hard time figuring out. Uh, the ethnic groups that come in, uh, primarily Germans from the original gold strike in 1858 up until World War I. Germans are most populous and actually the most profitable group, most prosperous group, I should say, in Colorado. Then the Irish, the Italians, the English. Let's see, we've got a whole list of these. Uh, oh, and the Chinese. This is kind of the saddest story. We don't have a Chinatown today. Uh, although we have an increasing Chinese population because of the Halloween anti-Chinese riot back in 1880, uh, when Chinatown is looted and burned, some Chinese are tamed out of the state, and that's why we don't have a Chinatown today. That's one major population group we're missing in a global perspective. Uh, let's see, the booms and busts, gold, uh, silver, coal, oil, molybdenum. Uh, more recently, it's been kind of a marijuana boom, and that too is busting. But that is attracting some people into the state, I think, for one reason or another, and also the boom in beer, which seems to bring uh, beer drinkers, at least, into Colorado. Uh, any of you have any questions, we welcome those. Uh, so let's see, what's next here? All the... Uh, rapid growth in recent years where Denver and Colorado have been outgrowing the rest of the nation, an estimated 5.8 million people here by uh, 2020, but I think the state demographer will, will get into that shortly. And I'll surrender to the next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Tom. We really appreciate that and um, really interesting hearing more about some of Colorado's history. I was uh, Surprised to learn that gold was first found in the um, in Cherry Creek at the Platte. I didn't realize that's uh, what brought everybody here. So really well, that's nice to learn about. Little that. strike that launched the Colorado Gold Rush. Yeah, very interesting. We've got one question in the chat um, of how the fire started in um, in Chinatown in the 1880s. It was set uh, by inebriated whites. Uh, they worked harder. They worked for less, and they did a better job than many whites. Many uh, white workers. I set that town on fire and chase the Chinese out. Wow, what a what a piece of history that I I didn't know about here, and um, I think you know we we are lacking a lot of that culture here. So um, thanks for sharing that. It's good to know why we don't have a a Chinatown like district um, that so many big cities have. So um, there is now a historic marker up finally at Hop Alley between Market and Blade, the heart of the Denver's Chinatown. Okay, great. So next time we're uh, out walking around in a distanced and masked way, we can, uh, we can look for that signage. Thank you, Tom. We really appreciate your contribution this morning. Really interesting to hear. Great to be on. Thank you, Hillary. Thank you. And next we'll go to our second speaker. That's the Okay, can you hear me? We can hear you. We really are excited to have you here, um, Elizabeth, to share from the uh, State Demographer's Office as our lead demographer. Thank you so much for being here. Can't wait to hear. Perfect. And just let me know, can you see my screen? Can you see yeah, my deck? We got your Perfect. slides. We got your voice looking good. Thanks. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks again for inviting me to be here. So just to kind of follow up. And then what Tom was talking about is kind of where are we now and where are we going into the future? Um, it is, these are kind of the big trends that I think all of you should take away from this. Um, 
you know, we talk a lot about growth, but we are starting to slow down. And I think there's implications, especially uh, for the labor force. And so I'm glad to uh, know the, the next speaker is going to be talking a little bit more about that. In terms of location, we've seen a lot of the concentration of the growth along the uh, I-25 corridor, along the Front Range. Obviously, aging is something that's been impacting Colorado and impacting us more than other places um, and will continue to impact us. And, and obviously, I think a little bit about why uh, you're holding this event. Um, more importantly, um, or also, we're becoming more racially and ethnically diverse. And so that will really be talking a little bit about what's coming up behind, you know, where are we getting the infill from our younger adults? And what this really does set up is this concept that we're gonna have a pretty significant labor force transition. Uh, one, in terms of attracting workers, uh, in terms of migration, um, a tight labor market, which we saw pre-COVID because again, we've seen a slowdown in growth and an increase in folks leaving the labor force. Uh, and Colorado is not as competitive as we used to be just simply because of price, cost of housing, daycare, healthcare, all expensive compared to a lot of our partner states. And so if we look at understanding population change, this shows us from 1970 through current and this kind of slowdown in population growth. And so we can see at the far right, slowing down on both net migration, which is in the red, as well as natural increase, which is um, the blue component, which is births minus deaths. Um, we can see though that net migration, just like what Tom was talking about, is really important to Colorado. It's about 60% of our total population change has been due to migration. If we see where we're locating, it's along the I-25 corridor. All of the counties that are red, orange, yellow have been growing. All of the shades of blue have been declining. So we're really seeing this concentration of growth along the I-25 corridor. And this is counter to historical trends. We've seen this across the United States where cities are getting bigger and rural areas are getting smaller. We're curious how COVID is gonna fit into that, but certainly it's a trend that's been taking place, but it also makes a lot of sense. It has a lot to do with where we've seen job growth. So this map is the same concept. Red, orange, yellow has been positive. Shades of blue is declines, but this is looking at job growth since pre-recession peak. So since that first recession back in 2000, you know, like anywhere between five and nine when you went into it, and in current in um, 2019 shows that growth. So again, what we've seen is this concentrated job growth along the I-25 corridor. So it's, it's interesting, chicken egg concept is what drives um, growth and what drives migration. And really a lot of it has to do with job growth. Where has the job growth been and in what industries? And so we've seen this great deal of growth in service-based industries really driven by health services, which has been due to aging. And so it's kind of, again, it's this, which comes first. It's the jobs have been growing in the areas where all of the people are creating more demand for people than creating more demand for jobs because of this service oriented demand for people, uh, service uh, jobs growing stronger than other industries. So if we talk then a little bit about age and what's driving a lot of this uh, job demand, we can look at our age structure because again, it's important. I think age is probably the most important thing that we look at within our society because how we act and what we do is all based on age, how much we spend, what kind of areas we spend it in. We can look at consumer expenditures. So this is our age distribution for the state. You can see the purple are our baby boomers and we've got our green Gen X, our red millennials, and then our subsequent populations, Gen Z, and then our future generations in the blue, in the brown. <clears throat> Big takeaways is one, look at the black line, which is at 65, and that looks at who's aging into the 65 plus. We can then also look at the left side, which is then who is aging in. And so we can really see this slow down at our youngest ages. And so this is very different than what we've seen historically. Historically, um, we tend to see the, the young end growing bigger, um, and the older end growing smaller, but now we're kind of going on the counter pyramid where we're getting a smaller base. And so this will have a pretty big impact in Colorado as well as the United States. If we take all of that and we look at who do we think we're gonna be in 2050, you know, like Tom was right on, on 
on topic in terms of where we are in 2020. We're at about uh, 5.8 million people in 2020 forecast to increase by about 2.1 million by 2050. So getting to be about um, the 8 point or uh, 7.9 million by 2050. But where do we see most of that growth? Definitely in that 65 plus. If we look in just total terms, as well as percentage growth, we see it really the most growth is gonna be happening in that 65 plus. So what we really need to do in terms to understand our economy and migration and housing and everything is that the jobs demanded by the spending of the 65 plus is what's gonna be really what's growing over these next couple of decades. And in fact, you can probably see on this chart that our 65 plus is actually gonna be larger than our under 18. Um, and this definitely has um, implications across the board. Implications in terms of economic drivers, as I had mentioned before, implications to, to the labor force. So that's why I'm excited to hear from the next speaker in terms of knowing that we've got more actually leaving the labor force than entering. And so we're going to feel this tightness. We don't feel it today because of COVID, but into the future we will be, as well as then looking at these other implications in terms of housing, income, health, disabilities, transportation, public finance, all impacted by aging as well. Last piece to bring up is the fact that we're also becoming more racially and ethnically diverse. If we look at our youngest population, uh, we've got a much stronger share people of color. So that's what this graph shows. The blue is where we were in 2015, showing our share of the population that are people of color. And so we can see that our young under 18, 43% um, compared to our older population, which are uh, less diverse where we're forecasting by 2050. And the reason I share this graph is for two reasons. One, when we see this growth forecast to the future of where we're gonna be and what we're gonna be like is one is we're gonna be much more diverse, um, but growing from our youngest ends. And that's gonna impact our labor force, demands for goods and services, preparation again for our labor force, so looking at education and everything else. But then as well as we age, we're also going to be becoming more diverse. And so our needs as we age are also going to be potentially different based on our race and ethnicity. So just to tie things up again, where do we think most of this growth is going to be? Because that was one of the questions poised to me was if nothing else changes, if we don't see a big change in these plans and in this pattern, most of the growth will be along that I-25 corridor. The shades of blue are counties that we're actually forecasting declines between now and 2050. So with that, I will stop sharing and see if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. We did have a question. Um, what caused the inversion of population change from 1985 to 1988? I think from that um, earlier graph. Right, so we, what we saw was a net out migration. Uh, we had both the savings and loan bust as well as the oil and gas bust. It was very localized in Colorado. So we had lost a ton of jobs. People leave. Again, most of our jobs are, most of our population is driven off of job growth. And so when we lost all those jobs and it was concentrated in Colorado, they, we had net out migration for five years. Wow. Yeah. Interesting to, to see what's behind some of those maps. That's great. Um, we had another question. Uh, we know there's a lot of activity to attract companies and employers to Colorado. Should Colorado also be actively recruiting and incentivizing working people to relocate here from other states to build our labor pool? And what do you expect to happen to our rural counties that are in population decline? So lots, lots to unwrap there. Yeah, um, <laughs> there's even another the one. First, <laughs> the, the first piece really is to understand that there is this connection between jobs and workers, jobs and population. A lot of times people think that just people show up, but most of the time it's driven because of job demand. Um, our concern is that piece that we may not be able to continue to attract and retain like we have historically because Colorado is not as competitive. So I think it's gonna be really important for employers to work with the state and work with local governments to understand that balance between the two and look at you know, housing that fits the needs of both the jobs 
as well as the population, looking at daycare, healthcare, education, all of those pieces that would attract somebody and keep somebody in an area. I can tell you that the East Coast is on a decline and they are definitely competing hard to try and attract our population back East and the upper Midwest. So I think that's a big piece. And then I forgot the second part of the question. Um, so this is asking about uh, rural counties. So uh, oh. what do you expect to happen there with the population in decline? And, um, and an addendum to that is what's the state's vision to avoid them being feeling like they're deserted in 20 years? And you know, how do we keep engaging that population? Right, so it's an interesting thing. A lot of it has been due to the types of jobs we've been creating. The biggest growth in our jobs have been service oriented, not production or goods oriented. Um, so service jobs locate where there's people. If there are no people, then it's really hard to provide services to them. So it is a weird kind of a chicken egg. Uh, so it's, I'd, I wouldn't even take it from the point of that the state is abandoning them. It's the point is they've got to look at reinventing themselves. If we're not going to be as uh, goods producing or try and step into that market of more goods producing. And so that's really looking at manufacturing and other things that are related to maybe more natural resources. Um, and so that's the balance or see if there's a way they can distance you know, using remote, get into that service sector. And I think that's one advantage from COVID is that we're really looking at those opportunities of being able to do things remotely. And if that works out, then it makes a lot of these rural areas um, actually a win-win. People can stay there and work and it's less densely populated, which might be attractive to people, less costly in terms of housing, but still daycare and healthcare are expensive. So we've got to come up with those solutions. Great point, thank you. Uh, we had one final question. Um, you had mentioned uh, that aging is impacting Colorado uh, more than other states. Can you just um, explain that a little bit more? Why is it impacting us um, more than, than some of our neighbors? So it's a weird thought. You have to think about it this way. It's the, the we're affected more primarily because we don't have a lot of older people to begin with. So if you remember that chart, we don't have very many people on that right-hand side of the black line, uh, simply because when we migrate people to Colorado, we migrate young adults. And we really started our first big migration uh, back in the 70s, and they were the baby boomers. And it's just taken them 30 to 40 years to get older. Uh, we don't migrate older adults like a Florida or an Arizona. So that's why it's odd here. It's just that it's taken a long time for us to get older. Um, and we just don't have a lot of people in that 65 plus right now. And since that's, that's growing, we're maybe less prepared and have less uh, resources from the federal government because we haven't had the numbers uh, until now as they're, as they're growing. Absolutely. And so we, I agree with you on that point that we may not be prepared. Well, I really appreciate this. This is so great to hear about and I appreciate the questions as well. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, hopefully you can stick around if anybody has questions towards the end as well. Super. Thank you. Thank you. I'll next kick it to Annie Davies. She is the Western Regional Director for United Way and is now in charge of their efforts to connect regional branches of the United Way uh, with the United Way Worldwide Office. She previously served as the CEO of the United Way of Larimer County and has deep ties to Colorado. She's an expert on employee volunteerism and engagement and we're really excited to hear from you, Annie. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hillary, and thanks, Jake and Jason, for inviting me to speak today. Um, this is a treat to be on with our state demographer and Dr. Colorado. So I'm going to try to share my screen. Let's see. Okay, and Hillary, can you let me know if I'm good? Looking good, thanks. Okay, great. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, a corporate case for CSR, um, and that is corporate social responsibility. Um, 
I love the picture of the guy in front of his um, computer. Um, I think we've all had those days and um, in the time of COVID where you just are not quite sure that you can handle one more Zoom call. Um, right now, of course, exempted. Um, but um, we are living in a different world and, and that does have ramifications to how we're connecting um, big picture. So. First of all, I wanna say that I really admire the work of a little help um, and not only your work to keep um, older adults in their homes, but also on a bigger picture, your work that really not really bringing neighbors together to help one another. Um, as Hillary mentioned, uh, my background most recently was with um, United Way, and I was attracted to that work um, because of their belief in the power of civic engagement. Um, for those of you who might not be as familiar with United Way, they um, kind of have the three-pronged approach of really trying to keep everybody in the community engaged. Um, some people might do that through donations, some people might volunteer and others might advocate, but they really want everyone to have a seat around the table of community change. Um, and really what that community change is doing is providing for civic engagement, which leads to greater social capital. So. Um, there we go. So some of you, um, and again, I really am going to get to so, uh, corporate social responsibility, but I think it's worth, especially today, just talk, taking a little bit of a step back and looking at the umbrella under which corporate social responsibility really has grown out of, and that is really civic engagement. Um, you can see the couple stats um, on the screen, one of them that I stole from a little helps um, website, but um, many of you are probably familiar with Robert Putnam. Um, he was a Harvard professor and he wrote the best selling book bowling alone um, and it really um, the premise of that book was him showing the rapid decline in everything from rotary membership to visiting with me neighbors um, to, you guessed it, bowling in leagues in that, um, that happened during the second half of the 20th century. And he makes a strong case that that decrease in connection or decline in civic engagement and social capital contributes to a very variety of issues, including poor individual health, higher community crime rates, and decreased workplace productivity. And that productivity is where we make the jump to CSR and the corporate case for initiatives that not only help individual employees, but can also strengthen your brand and improve your bottom line. So what exactly is a CSR? Um, there are a lot of um, uh, definitions out there. Many of them are quite convoluted, if you ask me. Um, I'll read you one of them. The ensemble of policies, practices, investments, and concrete results deployed and achieved by a business, corporation, and the pursuit of its stakeholder interests. Clara's mud, right? Um, but really, at the end of the day, um, it is a wide there is a wide breadth of CSR activities there. And I think the most important thing is that they are something that the business can really bring its passion around. And it's also um, almost all successful CSR activities show a really clear um, connection between the business um, endeavors and those CSR activities themselves. Um, and we'll talk about a few examples. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of synonyms for CSR. So um, that just helps add to, I think, probably a little bit of the confusion on that. But those are some of the other terms that you um, might hear. And I, um, I kind of like it. This is from the Harvard Business Re Review. You know, their quasi definition is when they're talking about CSR is that it can run the gamut from pure philanthropy to environmental sustainability to the active pursuit of shared value. So again, just um, kind of illustrating the breadth of um, activities that can fall under that CSR umbrella. So, and okay, so. 
We all have so much on our plates right now. Um, if you are in the audience as a business owner um, or um, director, why would you um, even consider adding CSR um, activities to your plate? Well, I'm here to hopefully convince you that it might actually be um, a really good um, idea. And to start off, we'll, we'll talk about um, the biggest benefit that most businesses are looking for, and that is to their bottom line. So. As you can see from some of these statistics, um, there really is, and there have been um, hundreds of studies at this point that have showing a connection between a positive impact on bottom line and corporate social responsibility activities. Um, not only are people willing to pay more for products from companies that they perceive as being socially responsible. They're also more likely in the first place to select those companies um, for, um, for their business. And I love, um, I think it's the 45% um, uh, statistic that we have on here that um, says that 45% of consumers say that there is a brand that has offended them so much that they will never buy that brand again. So there's the positive and also the negative um, side of um, being a good social partner, being a good member of your community. And if you really screw that up, there can be some really negative um, repercussions for you on the other side. So and if the um, financial benefit is not enough to convince you, maybe peer pressure um, will be. So um, there has been a huge increase in CSR activity um, in the United States and really around the world. Um, there were quite a few articles when I was looking to brush up on my statistics that were actually from European countries. And um, as you can see on here, and this um, study was obviously probably published in 2016, um, showing that 81% of companies are now published publishing a CSR report, which means they are doing some CSR activities, which is probably actually low for the number of companies that are actually doing CSR work because they're not all going to publish a report. And this was specifically looking at um, companies in the S&P 500 index. Um, and as you can see that that number um, went up even um, more so, it was at 86% in um, 2018. One of the surprising things is it's not just companies like uh, Patagonia or environmentally friendly companies that might come to mind. There really is a very wide variety of companies engaging in corporate social responsibility activities. Um, I took one example off of um, the B Corp website, which um, B Corp is a certification that businesses around the world can achieve by meeting certain thresholds around um, corporate social responsibility standards. And that can be anything from environmental to um, really helping to encourage education and self-sufficiency among their employee base to doing outside activities, funding different nonprofits um, and getting engaged in external activities. Um, so one of them, from my home state of Michigan was, is over in Grand Rapids and it's actually a plastic company um, in Grand Rapids. And that company has really kind of revolutionized how they were doing business and how they were thinking about their place in the community. And are now helping their uh, lower wage employees move off of um, welfare or different public assistance programs into higher wage careers. And they are also doing a lot around um, environmental sustainability, diverting 100% of their waste from landfills. And Finally, um, as Elizabeth mentioned, you know, Colorado continues to be a state with a tight job um, market. And um, you saw probably in those, in her graphs that millennials um, are making up, they're the biggest population um, subgroup in our state right now. And millennials are all about CSR. So, um, and they are also entering, you know, their prime working years. Um, and so, the other component of um, where CSR really can help your business is in that recruiting, retention, um, and um, career progression So component. So you can see um, this was actually a study that was done recently in Europe where um, that 
component of institutional trust and civic participation were the most important um, for workers and different companies and in influencing their productivity at work. So if um, they were able to engage with their coworkers, if they were able to engage um, and trust that their um, business or organization was um, doing the right thing in their community, that they could believe in that mission, that actually made them more productive at doing whatever their job was, regardless of the function that they played in their company. Um, we also had a lot of um, uh, other studies that showed that those um, well-designed corporate social responsibility programs where it's actually intentional can increase productivity um, for your employees and, um, and decrease turnover, which we also know is really um, expensive for employees by 50%. So, and I'm gonna put the link to this um, presentation. I'll put it into the chat so people can look through these stats and look at my sources for information at the end. Um, and then, okay, so let's get on to these, um, kind of wrapping this up. Um, so in terms of corporate responsibility, why is it important to get engaged now? Um, you know, we are all, I think, a little bit, um, as those of us who have employees concerned about their mental health, there is a lot of isolation out there right now. And CSR activities are something that can bring people um, in your workplace together beyond just getting their day-to-day -day job done. And it also can decrease that feeling of isolation that your employees have. There's also a um, variety of studies out there that show that when you have are thinking about others or able to contribute to that greater good, you reap the benefits of better um, mental health for yourself. Also, we know that nonprofits right now really do need additional support. So many of them have had to change um, their operating models and obviously they're asked to be um, to do more and more right now in our communities. Related very much to a little help, um, there is a lot of isolation right there for our older adults. Um, there's a lot of housing insecurity um, and there's um, a very um, big and I think warranted uh, worry about educational decline that are all um, related to what's happening with school closures and um, just the other effects of so many ways that we are having to isolate in our in our communities today. So, and, oops. Um, some easy, you know, low lifts if your company or um, is not currently engaged in CSR activities. Um, here are some ways that you can still get involved during COVID. You know, we're not going to go in and all um, do a lot of the traditional volunteer activities um, that we've probably done around the holidays in the past. But that doesn't mean that nonprofits are not being creative with creating new virtual online opportunities. There's also things, um, you know, there's also um, an increased need for blood because we're seeing um, less donors um, feel comfortable going to hospitals. So uh, I know at United Ways and a lot of other organizations, there are blood mobile drives that are um, being advertised so that people can still donate in a setting that might feel more comfortable to them. Um, businesses can also incentivize board and committee service with local nonprofits. And I bring that up because we need great business leaders um, as part of these nonprofits. Almost every nonprofit has turned their um, board and committee meetings virtual. So um, if you have an organization that you're passionate about, it's a great way as a leader in the community um, to get involved and um, be able to really contribute during the time of COVID. And that I think is wrapping um, what I have up. Again, I'll, I'll put this presentation in the chat so you can see some of the um, uh, where those sources are coming from. And thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much, Annie. That's really great to, to see the research behind, you know, what we all know is so important to, to do in engaging employees in volunteerism and um, team building opportunities outside the office. So this, this was really great to, to learn more about and we really appreciate it. And we've got a few questions for you. Um, the first is what industries um, do you see as having the most uh, CSR and, and what's driving them to implement that type of program? I think we covered some of that. Um, is there an industry specific um, piece? I know we talked about um, like even plastics are, and engineering firms are getting into it. Um, 
you could have you speak to that. Yeah, I think, you know, um, for environmental companies or companies who are working with natural resource products, there's a definite, you see a lot of those going towards environmental initiatives, um, just because there's such a clear line of um, focus between um, the work that they're doing. You know, a lot of times um, when people might be helping um, a company think through a CSR strategy, they also, they always start with having that company think about who their stakeholders are and how can they best impact um, that that group that's closest to them. I would say beyond that, um, it might be, I probably see the most with companies that are already focused on um, networking and connections because it's a way to help build that skill potentially within their employee base, but also just you know, possibly get out there and, and, and meet somebody who's who is going to be a new client um, or there, where there is going to be a, an opportunity for a business connection. Absolutely. Definitely makes sense. A um, couple more questions for you. We have a coach of a local high school um, soccer team and is wanting to help keep the women resilient. Um, what ideas do you suggest in the form of um, giving? And, and we'll get into this a little more in the next segment, but um, you also mentioned doing, uh, assembling a kit for a nonprofit. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk more about those opportunities? Sure. Um, you know, I think with high school, um, women, um, I would explore um, some opportunities maybe for some online um, mentoring or tutoring with younger kids. Um, there's a lot of programs out there that are um, being developed that are trying to help put positive adult or older kid um, uh, influences with um, some of especially the elementary kids who are the ones who are struggling the most with this online um, learning environment. And also, you know, some of those kids who are coming from tough backgrounds where their teacher and that interaction may have been a really integral part of um, their um, of their world and they're missing that now. So I think the more that we as adults can help to fill that in, um, that would be, um, that's one of the, probably the best ways. And there are a lot of nonprofits out there that do, um, I call them service to go kits, but probably different nonprofits have different names for them. Um, if, if this um, participant is somebody in the Denver area, um, they might look into Mile High United Way, but I'm sure there's a variety of um, organizations there who might be assembling um, Thanksgiving baskets or or kit, um, kits for families around the holidays. Um, and um, so keep an eye out for that because a lot of times that's something that people can do and contribute to as a group. And then that just gets delivered to um, the client or to the organization. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I gotta give a plug for a little help here. We do little kindness kits and uh, some fun things around the house that you can put together um, as kind of busy bags for, a little, uh, for our older adults. Um, to let them know we're thinking about them. So lots of great opportunities to get involved. Thank you so much, Annie. We really appreciate your time and um, great information. And last but not least, we have our very own Jake Dresden. He's our Director of Outreach and Development at A Little Help and joined us actually in early March. So he's been really um, put his feet into the fire and has been uh, doing a great job uh, in turbulent times. He, his previous career was in education and he worked as a teacher and administrator at Grayland Country Day School for 17 years. Uh, one of his roles with A Little Help is to spread the word about the, the good work we're doing in the community and to help recruit new members to our community, uh, as well as volunteers, donor, donors, and just overall good neighbors. So we're really happy to hear from Jake as he shares more about A Little Help. Take it away. Awesome, thanks Hillary. Um, and before I begin, I just wanna thank all of you out there that took some time out of your day to come join us. Uh, I know people are very busy these days. Um, and also thanks obviously to my other panelists, Tom, Elizabeth, and Annie um, for sharing their insights and wisdom um, into Colorado history, demographics, and employee volunteerism. Um, I think it was really valuable. So uh, I have a slide deck up here and I uh, wanna share a little bit more about a little help and what we do and who we are and how you can uh, engage with us. I think that most importantly um, is what I would like to cover today. Uh, let me start here. So I suspect many of you on here know something about us. Um, some of you may know a lot, but there may be some neophytes out there that, that don't know uh, much about us. So I thought I'd start with a little background on who we are and, and how we started. So a little help actually started way back in, in 2005. Um, 
We were a small grassroots organization of neighbors that came together to form a network and saw a need. And the need was to help older adults in the community with tasks around the home. And uh, that need was great. And it grew throughout Denver and to some, some other neighborhoods and, and until 2011, when we officially became a little help and hired our first executive director, Dr. Paul Ramsey, who many of you probably know. Um, and we are part of what's called the National Village Network or Movement, um, which is a consortium of organizations like ourselves that work on issues related to aging. And by all accounts, I like to brag about us. It's part of my job. Uh, we're one of the most successful models in the country. Um, our mission is simple and clear. It's to connect neighbors to help older adults thrive. And the way that we do that is we create interdependent communities um, and foster relationships with people of all ages and all stripes. Um, we pride ourselves on being a really inclusive community. And one of the ways we do that for our older adult members is uh, we have what's called a pay what you can model. And that basically means that uh, older adult members that have the means and resources um, support us financially. And those that don't receive the exact same level of service. And that's really important to us. In terms of where we are, we've got uh, three current locations in Colorado, Denver Metro, which is our operations hub, which is where I'm coming to you from right now. Um, Northern Colorado serving Loveland, Berthoud and Fort Collins is growing extremely rapidly. We're doing great work up there. And then a, a smaller fledgling operation in Roaring Fork Valley that's also gaining steam. Um, we anticipate that we will probably be statewide um, the next four to five years and we're consistently scouting new locations that would work well for our model. Um, and then in terms of our numbers, um, in 2020, we have over 2,000 volunteers, regular volunteers, consistent volunteers that serve over 1,100 older adult members. Um, we did during the pandemic starting in March when I started uh, have a flurry of new volunteers come on board and uh, about 900 of them. We onboarded them and trained them um, and they're with us today. Why volunteer? Um, Annie expertly went over this in the last presentation, so I'll be brief here, but there are a couple of other reasons that I'd like to reinforce about why you should consider volunteering. First of all, um, we provide critical, crucial services to our members, things that they depend on, um, and they help uh, our older adult members have a higher quality of life and save them time and money in the process. Um, our core services that we provide are things like help around the house, um, transportation to appointments, care calls, check-in, snow shoveling, tech support, basically you name it. What our members need and our volunteers are, are able to provide, we'll try to facilitate. Um, I talked about connections already. That's uh, what a little help is based upon. That's the premise of our organization is to create those connections. Uh, and I think it's important to point out that for some of our older adult members, our volunteers that we call them helpers are some of the only people they see on a regular basis. So fostering and nurturing those relationships and those connections is really important, especially during COVID, as you can imagine. Um, Annie talked about this, but there are health and, and wellness benefits to volunteering. Um, numerous studies show um, that it's good for you emotionally, uh, physically, and uh, we believe that the relationship that we create between our members and our volunteers is really reciprocal. Um, both people benefit um, from that relationship. It's, uh, it's good work. Um, and then lastly, for those of you out there in organizations and business concerned um, getting involved with us, we know that during COVID, it's been tough. People have been forced to work remotely, and that sometimes takes a hit um, for morale. Um, but uh, groups that have come out during COVID, some corporate groups um, to do yard work, have consistently talked about how much they appreciate being able to, to bond with their teammates in a safe manner, seeing their smiles and sharing a joke and doing good work. Why now? Why is it important now? Annie also talked about this, um, but I'll piggyback on it and talk a little bit more about why now had a little help. So our COVID response, as I said earlier, you know, we mobilized almost a thousand new volunteers from March to about June. Um, and their job was to stabilize our members and make sure that they were safe. Um, and they did that by doing uh, grocery and medication runs, making regular care calls, um, and socially distanced check-ins. That work continues indefinitely and it will continue indefinitely um, as long as it's, it's needed. And, um, you know, we continually work on best practices, what we can and cannot do for our members. Safety is of utmost importance to us. Um, secondly, uh, Annie talked about this as well. Fighting isolation is always a challenge for us, but uh, during COVID even, even more so. Um, 
And so we created a program, Hillary referenced it, called Kindness Kits, where our volunteers could sift around the house and find bags of interesting stuff that our, we think our members would like, whether those are puzzles and games, uh, sweet treats, uh, some homemade art, what have you, and drop them off um, for our older adults to show them. It's a vehicle to show them that we care and we're thinking about them. We've also changed some of our programming around and have some new programming, things like reverse ice cream socials where people meet in yards, enjoy some ice cream. I guess you're noticing a little uh, sweet theme here. Um, coffee in the park, um, and then transitioned a lot of our other programming to virtual, something like what we're doing right now. And then another thing that you may be familiar with called Tough Talks, which is basically a seminar where we invite experts um, to talk about issues surrounding aging for our members. We had one just yesterday that had over 100 attendees. Um, and then lastly, I just encourage you to think back yourself for you and your family, how difficult it has been and how isolated it's been for all of us. And then imagine being an older adult member with no family around and thinking about how uh, even a run to a grocery store would be dangerous for you. Um, lastly, older adults, and Elizabeth talked about this, so I'll be brief here, but we know that uh, our older adult population is growing. Um, there are about 10,000 boomers that turn 65 in the United States every day, um, about 30% of the Denver metro population is of that age. And AARP estimates that 90% of those people would like to stay in their homes. It's better for them financially and better for them emotionally, it's a better choice. So we are designed to address that population and to serve them. Why us? There are lots of great nonprofits around Colorado that do great work and we are in communication with those people. Um, but we think we are uniquely positioned um, to actually do this work. We're experts on these issues um, and we have a long track record. As I said earlier, we've been around for 15 years, so we're a trusted resource in the community. In addition, we have lots of partnerships with other agencies and nonprofits around and people refer to us and we refer to them and that line of communication stays open and that's really important. Um, we also are flexible and nimble. Um, we pride ourselves on being that. Our volunteers, um, we consider the eyes and ears and sort of first responders to our older adult population. And when something is going on that we need to know about, they will tell us and then we'll try to intervene as best as we can. Um, for those of you out there in the organizations that have volunteered with us or are thinking about volunteering with us, um, we create custom opportunities for you. If Friday afternoon at two o'clock is the only time that you can get out with your team, um, we'll make something happen for you then. And uh, it's meaningful work. You can see the results, you know, and uh, see the results um, that affect our members and the smiles that they have and their words of appreciation, which is really important. How should you engage with us? Most importantly, there's you know obviously a variety of ways. I've talked a lot about volunteering, but I think before I talk about um, that anymore, I think it's important to just recognize and acknowledge that the COVID situation in our state and around the country is dire. Um, and so we recognize that you might not be able to engage with us right now, but we'd like to initiate that conversation and see if down the road there are ways that we can get you out. Um, we can do yard work right now as a group, and if you're interested in that, um, please contact me. A additionally, uh, employee giving. If you're in an organization and you have this program set up, we would love to be the recipient of your generosity. Um, so we can start a conversation about your employee giving programs and whether or not a little help should be involved there. Sponsorship is another great way that you can get involved and we can market your good work that you do in the community to our audience. Traditionally, we have an array of, of events that I've mentioned already, and those are ways that we can get you in front of our audience. Um, and in addition, we can use all of our communications, whether that's print, our newsletters, uh, our social media channels, um, our emails. Uh, we have approximately 8,000 people in our database that receive those communications. So lots of people can hear about what you're doing. Um, and then last but not least, donations. Um, we're a small shop. We've got 10 employees. Um, we work extremely hard to, to service all of our members, but we rely on the generosity, as I said earlier, of organizations like yourself and, and donors to keep us going. We also pride ourselves on being a contact organization. What I mean by that is uh, when our members call, our staff picks up the phone and they talk to them and they, they sort of figure out what needs to be done. And our members like that. Um, and that takes a lot of labor. We have an awesome operations team. I just want to do a quick shout out to those, those folks on our operations team in Denver. We have Tanya, we have Jessica, we have Giselle, we have Beth and super volunteer Helen. In Northern Colorado, we have Jason, Steve, Krista, and last but not least in Roaring Fork, we have Rick. Um, and the work that we're doing is important. We would like to serve more people 
And as such, we need the financial resources to be able to do that. Don't just take my word for it. Um, we have a testimonial uh, from a volunteer named Rochelle. Rochelle is an executive assistant with Cablaco Services. Cablaco has been involved with a little help for a long time, supporting us financially and volunteering with us. And Rochelle has been sort of brains behind that operation, getting uh, employees to come out. She also volunteers in her own time. And so let's hear from Rochelle. We started with helping out for the Fiesta de Mayo, their annual fundraiser. I would help decorate and just get things prepared. Very fun event. They had it every year. Unfortunately, they were not able to do it this year. Um, my husband and I subsequently got involved on the service Saturday side. We were able to recruit people from the company and also recruit friends. And everyone was on board, enjoyed the experience. We would go to different people's houses, help them with things like yard work, Something as simple as bringing patio furniture out for the summer. Um, just those little things that we take for granted that some can't do anymore. Uh, we did help one lady who wanted to grow her own food uh, establish a garden. So we all went in, we raked the grass, we set up rows of dirt and planted the seeds. And she was very, very uh, grateful for that. On two or three occasions, we got we just recruited, we put the word out, um, and those who wanted to help, we just met at a um, pre-designated area, and then we would break off in groups. And a lot of those people helped with, again, yard work, pulling weeds, um, cleaning up winter stuff from the back. Um, and then we would meet afterward and kind of have lunch and talk about the experience, and, and we always got positive feedback with that. Um, we also we even created Team Coblaco t-shirts to help identify us as a group. Um, so it was a nice experience. I mean, each time, and my friends as well, each time um, we, uh, I, I think we would work three or four hours at a time. And that seemed to be perfect. We were very productive. Uh, as I understand, we were very helpful. And... Yeah, it was just a good overall feeling to contribute. We're, we're a very scattered company. We have a lot of guys who go on site to different jobs in the field. And so we don't really get a chance to have lunch together or really do a lot of team functions um, at the facility itself. So when we're able to devote, say, a Saturday morning or um, maybe a couple hours in the evening to some sort of function for a little help. It helps us get to know each other too and kind of get to know our talents. And, you know, uh, some of the guys really got into the weed digging thing and they knew all the, the best tools to do that, which, you know, helped me because I certainly didn't know. And, and certainly I brought that home to my backyard. Um, so it's just nice to kind of get to know your coworkers outside of the company. The uh, organization itself, the people who work there are great to work with. They're organized. They, you know, it's a very simple process. You, you sign up to volunteer and they will direct you where you need to go. They'll direct you in terms of uh, uh, different things you can do to help, when you can do them, um, how. Uh, they really set you up nicely for the volunteering experience. I have volunteered at other companies or other organizations before that where the experience felt a little more scattered and you were pretty much on your own. And I never got that feeling with a little help. Um, I strongly encourage anyone who's interested in signing up if they have the time, the resources. And I, uh, I just think it's a great, great organization doing very, very important work, especially right now, given the year we've had and given the desperate need for help that so many have, uh, including our seniors. Um, so it's a very, very relevant and paramount uh, purpose to serve right now. Thank you, Rochelle, and thank you, Cablaco. You guys are a, a very valued partner and, and have been for a long time. Um, I'd like to just close by telling you my story about how I got involved with a little help. As Hillary mentioned before, uh, my previous career was in education, and I worked at uh, Grayland Country Day School. 
and uh, I was a teacher. Uh, I was an administrator, and uh, I was a service and learning coordinator. And, and in my role as a service and learning coordinator, uh, I was always looking for opportunities to uh, get the kids out and serve in the community. And believe it or not, um, those opportunities are really hard to find. But when I stumbled across a little help um, many years ago, I knew that this would be an organization that I could work with. And uh, not just for the kids, but for all the people in the community, faculty and parents alike. And uh, in my work there, I realized that it should become part of my personal life as well. And my family and wife and daughters have become a part of a little help and have volunteered for many years. And we cherish and value the relationships we have with the members and volunteers we've met over the years. And some of them we consider really dear friends. Um, so I am a personal testament to the power of a little help and, and what it can do for volunteers um, and for members. And with that, I would just encourage you to get involved um, any, kind, any way that you can. Um, I think my uh, contact information is right there. Um, my, uh, the office number, you can always reach us there. There's my mobile number um, and email jake at a little help.org. So thank you so much. I don't know, Hillary, if there are any questions. We have a couple of questions here, um, and I think more are about getting involved personally, but um, we've got some folks who want to volunteer with their kiddos and uh, want to contact you with their soccer team, and uh, looks like we've got a lot of folks ready to volunteer. Um, we really appreciate all your time today. We really appreciate our panelists, Tom, Elizabeth, Annie, Jake, and Rochelle. Uh, we're just so happy to hear from all of you today. and. Uh, are so grateful again that you've spent your lunch hour with us. I'm sorry we've taken you a little over, um, but we'll let you get going on your day. And um, please do contact um, me or Jake with any uh, further questions. We had a couple questions going through the chat that we can um, 